parents have some concerns of some stuff they may have found in your room? Yeah, I believe so. And what, what would it be? A human head and hands. Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me on today's episode of Did Sherilyn Wear This T-Shirt For Two, Two Nights, Like Sleep In It and Then Decide To Film In It Today? Yes, yes, she did. Okay, today's case is another one that is just unbelievable. Shout out again to Explore With Us. You guys know I love like interrogation footage, body cam. They're like my favorite channel to go on. And when they released this episode last week, I was like consumed. Um, I, I had to look and dig and watch everything that was out there. So th thanks to the team over there for getting me into a rabbit hole. Um, yeah, there is a lot to go through. So we are going to get started. Before we do though, I have a quick message for you. Today's video is sponsored by none other than Fume. You know, I absolutely adore my Fume. I also adore the company. If you have never heard of them though, let me get you caught up. Fume is an innovative award-winning device that helps with what can be a very stressful transition of breaking bad habits into a much more enjoyable and attainable process. Instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, fume uses flavored air. I have seen comments before asking, okay, well, how is it good if you're still like inhaling like a vapor or smoke and you don't? It's, it's, it's flavored air, so there are no harmful chemicals. You're not blowing out like big clouds of chemicals. <laughs> If you've seen my videos on Fume before, you already know how much I absolutely love my Fume, how much it has helped me. And I also love seeing comments from you that it, that not only has it helped other people too, like I love seeing that, but how you can relate to the comfort and the weight of the and the fidget aspect of it. Because Fume has both. It's like my comfort of weight and then my fidget. So it has an adjustable airflow dial and it's just designed with all of these mov movable parts and magnets so that you can just keep yourself and your fingers busy, which is very, very important and helpful. And just to kind of like de-stress and channel your anxiety somewhere else when you are trying to break a habit and it's kind of like all that you're thinking about and consuming you. So it's nice to be distracted with 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 a little device and like one that is like very like sharp and like sleek and sexy if I do say so myself. They also now have the base, which launched in January, and it is it's a weighted stand. And like I said in my last video, this baby is is weighted. It is nice, so you rest your fume on it when it's not in use. Also has a magnet on there to keep the fume attached, and then you can also spin it around and and fidget with it too. So more fidgeting. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and they have thousands of success stories, myself being one. There's no reason you can't be one too. You can join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. You can now also upgrade your journey pack to the Solano to enjoy this premium walnut barrel and onyx black coated mouthpiece that has just a, a smoother finish. Head on over to try Fume dot com slash Sherilyn Dale or scan the QR code and use code Sherilyn Dale to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That is tryfum.com and use my code Sherilyn Dale to save an additional 10% off your order today. Thank you so, so much again, Fume, for everything that you have done for me and for continuing to support my channel. It means so much to me and thank you all too for supporting Fume as well because that in turn also supports me. So thank you all so much. All right. Today's episode is a, it's a doozy. It's, it's, there's a lot to process. There's a lot to go through. Not only is it extremely disturbing, I have a lot of opinions that I'll obviously like go through at the end and share with you, but I feel like we need to have like a little bit of a, um, a grounding moment here. So what better way to do that than to have a riddle, you know, bring, bring back an old riddle. I know you guys miss the riddles. I miss them too. So today's riddle is a man is trapped in a room that contains only two exits. The first is constructed of magnifying glasses that Fry anything that walks through when the sun is out and blazing hot. The second exit includes a fire-breathing dragon that is bound and determined to kill. 
how does the man escape? And if you're new here and never seen how we do the riddles, stay tuned till the end where I give you the answer. All right, researching this case was it was almost unbelievable at times when I watched the interrogation footage. It made me it made me feel physically ill sometimes, not just because of the description of the crime, which side note is horrific, you know, as we get into this, um, but because of how unemotional, cold, and unserious this teenage killer is. Like I said, I do have some things that I want to touch on in terms of mental health diagnoses that are going to get brought up because in my opinion, there was it was not just like mental health issues here. There was a lot of alarming signs and a number of adults in this teen's life who were aware, brought it up, saw and didn't really do, do a lot. And I don't want to say that to act like I'm like, oh my gosh, they know finger pointing and like this is their fault. But it is a really serious lesson for all of those who have made comments like about somebody they've known or heard somebody say like, oh, I, I'm not surprised. Like, oh, we just thought that it was like a you know, he was always joking around about murder and stuff or comments like if if there was ever going to be somebody who, you know, took a gun into our school, we figured it would be this guy. So those comments need to be taken more seriously because um, who we're going to be talking about made lots of those comments and then carried through with something that is absolutely monstrous. We are going to start this case with a call that came in to police at 2 a.m. on Sunday, February 28th, 2001. The callers were Terry and Brian Cohey, who are calling on behalf of their 19-year-old son, Brian Jr., who had just told his parents that he messed up. Police were called to go to Blue Heron Boat Ramp, and when they arrived, they encountered a very embarrassed Brian, as well as his parents, who explained that he had parked his car, a Ford 500, too close to the water at the boat ramp and that the, the vehicle got swept up into the river. How do we call a tow for that? I don't know, because he'd have to get in the friggin' water. Yeah. I caught Lax towing. They want me to text them a photo of the car because they think they might be able to pull it out. Okay. His parents are kind of talking for him and, you know, embarrassed on their part saying, you know, we've we've even waited to allow him to get his license. He only recently got it because we didn't want him to get it when he was allowed to at 16 because we wanted to wait until he's more mature. So sure enough, the the officers look out into the the Colorado River and there is the vehicle like kind of, you know, bobbing and floating and they even have a chuckle as they're being like explained what's going on and just kind of like, hey, you know, it's it's okay, but like we make mistakes. What the officers didn't know is this is was the start of a very, very sinister story. Hey, partner, you want to come out and talk to me real quick? Sure, I Appreciate mean, it, I'm really cold. Is Doesn't it okay if it's in here? Because he that's fine. Pants he had okay. That's fine. Yeah, I, didn't, I did not out. know that. No, yeah. that's, please, please, please stay in the car. Yeah. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Nobody else in the car? Nope. No, okay. no, just us. I'm the father. That's the mother. And this is our son. He just like, Sounds good. 20 minutes ago and said, Dad, I parked at the boat ramp and I messed up. He's I tried like, to get out of the car and slid down. Well, you're not hurt, right? You're okay? No, just a little cold is all. Beside your pride a little bit? <laughs> and probably seven thousand dollars the officers do up a short report they get a tow truck organized for the cohes to come and and try to get the vehicle out of the river and they say that brian is free to go home and warm up since he is he's soaking wet from getting out of the vehicle that was getting swept into the river and it was a cold night so terry and Brian Sr. take Brian home. They soon return to the boat ramp without Brian. It's about an hour later, and at this time, the tow truck is already there, kind of working on how they're going to get the car back to shore. And that's when the officers let Brian's parents know that they noticed like something a little bit unsettling on the vehicle. And it's on the back bumper just under the license plate. There's like the spot of red that the officer compares to looking like blood and it almost looks like it's dripping down a bit. So they pointed out to the parents and ask if 
Brian was injured that they knew of. In front of the officers, Terry calls Brian to see if he maybe cut himself somewhere and didn't even notice just because of all the adrenaline that was running through him. He does like a look over and says, no, it looks like he's okay and he has no idea what in the world it could be. So officers just kind of take it as it is and figure, you know, maybe maybe he's maybe he hasn't noticed or this is something old. And they they released the car back into Brian's parents' custody. Hello? Brian, are you okay? They see blood on the back bumper of the vehicle. Really? Yeah, did you get hurt? No. Are you sure you don't have any injuries? No, I'm fine. There's blood on it? What? We're not sure. We're it, not it's, sure. It's, it's a red, something red it, underneath the license plate. It's similar blood stain. Oh, no. All right, but you're not injured. You don't have any cuts? No, I don't know what would cause blood or whatever it is on the bumper. But you're not injured? No, I'm not injured. The very next day, March 1st, the police end up back at the Blue Heron boat ramp, boat ramp, boat ramp, when a friend of a an unhoused man named Warren Barnes is reported missing. It was the owner of a shop called Monique's Bridal that was worried because Warren would regularly come into her shop, sit and read books in in her store. And the last time that she had seen him was on Saturday at five o'clock. It was when she was closing up. She said, I'll see you tomorrow, Warren. And he said, okay, see you tomorrow, meaning he was planning on coming the next day, which was Sunday. When was the last time you saw him? Saturday, 5 o'clock. I said, I'll see you tomorrow, Warren. And he was like, okay, meaning he planned on coming down on Sunday. And then he did not show up. When he didn't show up and then she heard from other people in the area who also knew Warren because he would come and, and visit their shops and he hadn't, there was concern immediately among everybody. She had known him for four years and then found out that he never showed up for his his work shift. And that immediately caused concern because she knew how important it was to him and that he would never just not show up. He's explained as just being somebody who had a very predictable routine, like going to Monique's shop or there was another, I believe it was a coffee shop close by where he would have his morning coffee every morning without fail. The staff there said that he would show up around 6 a.m., sometimes even sooner. And if he was there earlier, they would open up the shop for him before other customers and he would sit and have his coffee. He literally shows up every morning, every day without fail, like at six o'clock, sometimes a little sooner. And we always let him in before the customers. We give him free coffee. He's the nicest old man ever. Do you talk to him at all? All the time. Hey, so good. every morning it's around six. Yeah. Without like, fail. Yeah. Without fail. And he's the nicest guy ever. Rough looking, but he is the nicest guy. So when everybody is talking and, and they notice that he's not doing his regular routine, immediately alarm bells go off. It was... Warren's employer who got a call and and that's kind of how the police were directed back to the boat ramp and this call came in it was a man that was inquiring about Warren saying that he found his wallet down by the boat ramp and to just get in touch with him so that he could return it and the boat ramp itself is what stood out to his employer and they told investigators it made absolutely no sense there wouldn't have been a reason for him to be down there he didn't have a camp set up down there or anything so just his wallet being down there was you know concerning enough he would never come down here he would never come all the so way down here. He doesn't so have a camp down here or anything? No. He worked for People Ready. And someone found the wallet and called People Ready this morning. And they said that everything looked like it was in there because he doesn't have much. And I just gave him $20 for beer. So I know that he had maybe a couple bucks. So they found his wallet just down here at the boat yep. ramp? Never that's why, that's why then... I'm freaked out because there's no way he walked all the way down here in his wallet. Just so here. in how many years? Did Four he years. For? Yeah, that's as long as I've known him. After this call, this investigation, it moves at warp speed. And I don't think anybody was really prepared for what they learned all around, including the investigators, even though, you know, you're, it's kind of the job to expect some really unsettling things. Now, it turns out that the man who called about the wallet was Brian's father, Brian Sr., who found it in 
his son's Ford that was accidentally sunk into the river the night before. I guess it didn't sink because it was retrieved, but, you know, they got swept away. And it was inside the wallet that he sees Warren's social security card and then a card for labor ready, which I didn't know what that was. It, I guess it's um, a kind of like a temp temp agency. I think they focus on like manual labor or light industrial. That's what that's what I, I got from from the interweb. If I'm wrong, please, please let me know. I can't blame everything on being Canadian, but I I try. So when Brian Sr. sees the the card, that's when he called to find out if Warren was there. And he finds out that he hadn't shown up for work, but that he'll, the, the employer will pass on the message if and when he sees him. After Brian hung up with the employer and finds out that Warren has not shown up for work and that the employer was quite concerned that there would be a wallet, you know, by the the boat ramp anyways, he brings up the concern with his wife and she decides to go into Brian's room. Brian had just happened to be hanging out at a friend's house. So she kind of had an opportunity to take a peek around and she makes her way to Brian's closet and makes a horrifying discovery. She explains that process of kind of digging through the closet and she notices a plastic bag, like a white plastic garbage bag and thought to herself, what is in here? What What is he, you know, what is he storing in his closet? Picks it up. It's quite heavy. And it almost seemed like there was, uh, she kind of described it as like, was there like maggots or something in there like that she could see? She didn't know what was going on. So she brings it to her kitchen, puts it in the sink, and then she rips one of the bags open and inside um, she sees what look, appears to be a, a human head. Now one is John with the address emergency. Hi, there is an emergency. I found, I found something in my son's closet wrapped in a plastic bag. Okay, what was it? I think it's a human head. It's a what? I think it's a human head. Why do you think it's that? Because it looks like it. it's all an ear. Is it all, is it bloody or does it like anything like that? I just told you to come. So do I have to take a picture and send it to you? What's you the just address? Come? Like I mentioned, Brian at this moment was not at home and Terry and Brian Sr. knew they needed to get him back, but they didn't want to make him think that they knew anything or that he was in trouble. They just said, you need to come back right away and said that his brother needed to use the vehicle for his driver's training. So he was on his way. But also at the time, uh, Terry had to also coordinate getting children that she cared for in her day home out of her house before this. So I guess she had called the parents, just let them know like everything is okay. Everybody is safe. But, but, you know, there's something serious going on and you need to pick up your children. Kids get picked up. Brian arrives and the police also arrive. They don't have like sirens or anything like that to try to scare him. And they approach Brian very casually, almost like friendly so that he's not alarmed or on the defense. And they just casually say, you know, your your parents have a little bit of concerns about some things that they may have found in your room. Do you know anything about what that could be? And he just says, yeah, a, a human head and hands. Parents have some concerns of some stuff they may have found in your room? Yeah, I believe so. And what, what would it be? A human head and hands. And that is pretty much how his demeanor is throughout all of his interaction with police when they ask him to get in the back of the, the patrol car. He's very cooperative, sits right down. He's almost even polite, you know, like, how are you, sir? Just sit back there and hang out with me, okay? How are you? I'm good, sir. How are you? You said your name is Brian? Yeah. Uh, right. I'm not feeling too well. You're not feeling too well? All right. No, these past few days, I've been very, very anxious. That's understandable. So what we're going to have you do here is I'm just going to have you sit in the back here, okay? Uh-huh. I'm going to turn on the air for you in a second. That way you're not too hot. Are you a hot-blooded or cold-blooded kind of guy? I am very cold-blooded. I prefer cold. Well, no, actually, sorry. Hot-blooded. Hot-blooded. So you prefer the cold. Okay, fantastic. Thank All you. right. So hop in here. I know you're tall, so it's a little bit of a tight squeeze, but like I said, I'll get that air on for you. Sorry about that. All right. Okay, Brian. 
Thank you. No problem, sir. So walk with me. We're going to walk right this way, okay? You're fine with me not being in cuffs. I'm fine with you not being in cuffs. Okay, thank you. All right, Brian, open this door for me, please. Just walk forward for me, Brian. Oh, I should have a mask. You're okay. Don't worry about it, okay? Keep on walking. This was like fresh out of COVID times as well. So people were also wearing masks and he was worried about having a mask on. And the officer was like, you know, it's okay. And then he also said, you know, are you okay with me not being in cuffs? And the officer was like, yeah, you're, you're fine. And that's, I think, what made a lot of watching uncomfortable for me was because there were these moments where he's, yeah, like polite and, and almost considerate. And then you listen to the story unfolds. So when they get to the back to the station, Brian is placed in an interrogation room as well as his his parents. And his parents basically explained the situation that happened the night before where the vehicle was in the river, it got towed back to the house, and Brian Sr. had gone through it just to kind of salvage as much as he could because they weren't sure if they were going to be able to use, have this car fixed or whatever. So he's going through and it was as he was going through the vehicle that he sees this wallet, opens it up and realizes this is not his son or anybody that the family knows. Not only did he find this wallet, but he also found a very large knife in the glove box and it concerned him enough to Asked Brian himself, you know, why is there a Brian, a, a, a Brian, a wallet in the car, Brian? And Brian says, oh, I found it down at the boat ramp when I was walking around there. So that is when he had called the employer to say, like, this is where it was found, even though he found it at the house in the car. Brian Jr. is telling Brian Sr. that he found it when he was walking around the boat ramp prior to the car getting swept into the river. Went back out there this morning just to continue, and I opened the glove box, and there was a knife in the glove box, under water. The glove box is full of water. Very large knife. And then, as I go around the passenger door, I open the passenger door, and there's a wallet in between this door, and I open up. That's not Brian's wallet. It's frozen solid. Like, like, kind of. That's not Brian's wallet. So I take it inside, and I end up getting one of the wads of cards out. It's a labor ready. I read that. So I call it labor ready, mm-hmm. and then another one, another one, there was a social security card. I was like, hey, this is a weird call, but I've got a wallet here with so-and-so's name, and I'm, I'm hoping he works for you all, or he's an, he, 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 he subbed him out or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, my one. We've been missing him. Yes, he didn't show up today. I'm like, oh, my God, now we've got a missing person. Brian senior and terry are both explaining that brian basically had kind of an answer for the questions that that he was giving and they're just it's their son they're just trying to take it at face value yeah maybe you know in hindsight it's is a little bit concerning to have the police wonder if there was blood on on him or why it looks like there's blood on the back of the car and then a knife in the vehicle and then somebody somebody else is wallet so they're kind of like going back like what is going on but I don't think that they ever would have thought that they would find what they did in his closet. And that's basically the gist of what they are explaining to the police. Now with Brian in his interview room, he's just as cooperative as he was like when officers arrived at on the scene. They learn he went to Broadway Elementary School. After that, he went to Brooklyn Middle School. And then after graduation, he got a part-time job as a beggar slash uh, the courtesy clerk at Safeway. And that's that's what he did for work at the time. They also learn that after middle, middle school is when he started to kind of show antisocial behavior and he was switched to fr- Fruta, Fruta High School. I think it was like more more geared with dealing and supporting children who had a little bit more struggles. And he apparently did great in, in the ninth grade. And then in the 10th grade is when he started to get in a little bit more trouble, bit more trouble. He had quite a bit of behavioral issues and was kind of, the teachers described him as quite disruptive and almost kind of wanting to push the boundaries, push the limits interrupt the class and say inappropriate things even like racist things at times and it was almost like a shock like for the shock factor of it just to just to push and make people uncomfortable 
His parents also had touched on this, that th- there had been concerns with the teachers about some of his behavior. H- Terry, his mom, said that he was brought in for testing and that he he had ADHD and that he possibly was also autistic. And we'll touch on this later just because of my, <laughs> you guys know me with like my frustration with placing blame and stuff like that. She also said that there was, they were waiting for a referral for potential testing of psychosis and at the time while they were were waiting for this call to come through he was on sertraline which is an anti-anxiety slash antidepressant it is my savior love sertraline to try and support him and assist him he was also seeing a counselor and his parents said that that is because they, they were concerned that he would he would make quite a bit not quite a bit a lot like pretty much every joke that came out of his mouth was uh, very morbid and they got concerned when he was also trying to push into almost like a like suicidal joking like oh you know I'm gonna I'm making these nooses and his parents weren't the only ones that that he was like that with either this everybody who knew him said that he was he was quite dark even his friends from that he had had since elementary said that he had a very morbid sense of humor everybody who talked about him that knew him the word morbid was used a lot those longtime friends also admitted to that that i guess personality trait of his is something that that did not make him very well liked by people he did not have a lot of friends he was often teased at school as well he'd be made fun of for wearing glasses or be called like a geek and a loser and I think that the way that his friends described it kind of further pushed him into more of the like I don't care I'm you know I'm dark and don't give a crap side. After the investigators kind of had a little bit of chit chat with Brian to get get to know him a little bit, they just go right into, okay, how how did we get here? Thinking, all right, let's let's say what you know, maybe what your thought process was or where where what what have you been up to lately that might be upsetting you? And he's just like very matter of fact. I murdered somebody. And how did you get here? I murdered someone. Okay. To start back to the beginning and go slow and tell me as many details as you can remember. So, because I mean, Murray going to jail for the 15 years probably. I have no idea. Because we're at the beginning. It's, <laughs> it's murder. I mean, I'm going to jail for okay. 20 probably. I mean, cut to the chase, I guess. This is probably what investigators do want. They don't want to spend a lot of time on, you know, painting the picture. They want to know what's what's going on. And he's just like, I murdered somebody and then even goes right into, so I'm probably going to get like 15 or, or 20 years, right? Like he's wanting to know what the consequence is for what he's done. Brian explains that on the night of February 27th, he was in a, a really bad state of mind. He explains that he had this depressive disorder and he was just not able to pull himself out self out of it and think positively so he was driving around for about an hour hour and a half this is something that he normally did do when he just wanted to to clear his head something you'll notice if you watch the whole uh interview all the way through is that he interrupts his story a lot of time so if you struggle like with adhd like me and like focusing um it was it was harder to follow because I'd be he'd ask a question and then you know instantly I'm intrigued by the the next question and then go back to the story as I'm doing right now which is probably not beneficial for anybody who struggles to follow along like I do but a lot of like his interruptions were kind of asking questions about what those consequences are going to be and he was putting himself in like a, a a category now and it was something that the the guys on explore with us had pointed out one of the uh, comments he made was oh you know before i go any f- further i have a question he asked people who have committed crimes like me do we stay in this county jail or are we moved and something that i noticed and then the the guys on explore with us pointed out was how 
fascinating, it was interesting, disturbing, that he compared himself to other killers, like people who have committed crimes like me, almost like he was, you know, now this, this was like a a new persona and he was associated with other people who had done horrific things. It's interesting to note how he compares himself to others with the phrase, people who have committed crimes like me, almost as if he has joined an exclusive club. So he'll kind of interrupt and ask questions along the way about how how he'll be treated or kind of bounce back to stories anyways. I'll try to do my best to focus and, you know, stay on the straight and narrow from here. So Brian says he's driving around and he's driving on the overpass and he sees this large thing is what he says wrapped in like a canvas and he says oh this is a homeless person he said he grabbed his knife he put on three layers of gloves he gets out of the vehicle he pulls back the the canvas is what he says the sheeting and he just immediately starts this man he explains it's oh like just to think back on like the explain the explaining because the way Brian is explaining this whole murder is so like cold and matter of fact. And then you just like think of how scared Warren would have been. Um, he says like immediately Warren is like has panic and is like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why? Why? Why are you doing this? And he's saying he he's like explaining in his 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 little old man voice. And it's like, oh my God, like ah. <sighs> and he just coldly explains that as he's panicked and confused and scared and shocked and hurt hurting he doesn't even flinch he just keeps him in the neck he also makes the comment that it was surprisingly easy and that he didn't fight back based on his positioning because he was kind of like straddling warren i pulled back the camera and i stabbed his neck Okay. He was panicking at first in his old man voice. He was in his 50s. I don't know why I, don't know why I call him an old man. He was saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why? Why? And I just kept on stabbing his neck. I was... Is it okay if I do a demonstration? Oh, yeah. This is him. I was straddled on top of him like this. Okay. And uh, he couldn't fight back. It was actually surprisingly easy. I was barely breaking the sweat. I thought, oh, this guy, he's going to be tough. But no, it was actually surprisingly easy. And during the time I was growling and making animalistic noises. Brian refers to the murder of Warren as the whole ordeal, which I like I said at the very beginning, like there were so many more. So it was just like I was just sick. And it's like hearing those comments. But the whole ordeal lasted only about a minute and a minute and a half, which he, in his mind, didn't think that it was going to go like that. And he said after he was done him at this point, since most of the trauma was to the head neck region, basically he was pretty much decapitated at that point. Now keep in mind, this is outside. This is just off the side of the road at like 11 o'clock at night. Anybody could have driven by and he says he wasn't too worried because he was standing there with a knife and you know had had still was wearing like a covid mask so his identity was concealed and he thought that based on his assumption of what people would do in that situation if they walked by it they would have like bystander effect that would kick in and that if there was like a group that walked by nobody would have done anything so he just felt like very i don't know i guess like in, invincible in that in that situation like he didn't seem to have a concern he describes after also taking the time to just do horrible things to warren's body he I, I don't want to get too much into detail, but he says that with his head, he gave him a the Glasgow smile. And when the investigators are like, what is that? He said, you know, like the Joker, the Joker smile. He had also um, cut open his stomach so that he could see uh, the insides, which he describes. And he describes like his actions and the and the movements to investigators like as if he was kind of in a frenzy like he was just trying to do like all the things so much because there was like adrenaline pumping through him he couldn't believe it so it was almost like he just started I don't know like just 
doing everything that would come to to his mind in that opportunity. He actually even says that like in his his frenzy, he was like, I was like, woohoo. And that when Warren was like, why are you doing this? He says like, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. So how long have you been planning or looking for someone to do this with before you found this guy? About a year. About a year? No, six months. So you come close or seen somebody or chickened out or anything in the past? No. I mean, I was looking for a deliberately secluded place like that one. I wouldn't just go up in Clifton and find someone walking down the street and stab them. No, that's, that's too public. Everyone sees that. Well, have you looked like at the homeless places or anything in the past? I have, yes. I would go on night drives often, maybe once every two weeks. Now just peruse the streets. So before this guy, how close have you come in the past? Not at all. Not at all? You just drive around? And yeah, look, just try and find Is anybody interesting? And no. Investigators asked if there were any photos that he had taken that evening. Brian says that, yes, he had, but he had deleted them entirely. Investigators did get assistance from the U.S. Secret Service, so they were able to pull photos off of Brian's phone and show evidence of what he did. And th there was a lot. Brian didn't leave really anything out, so there were his testimony, like his admitting what he had done for evidence and then these types of things also that supported not only is it coming from his phone but acts of him covering up what he did in the event that he would say you know investigators are thinking in the event of him possibly wanting to have like a an insanity defense there was nothing missed in the interrogation and like i said the coldness is it's something that I don't know if I've ever seen. And I just kept thinking about, you know, Warren's loved ones to hear that. Like, I don't even know what I would have done, like what I would do to try to compose myself. And I also thought about the investigators because that would have to be the oddest feeling for investigators to want to know everything for their case. But then, you know, you've got to imagine like, trying to sit there, keeping the conversation going, listening as these details are being told. And not that you're, you know, into hearing it, but you're just like, oh, you know, understanding, pulling more, asking questions like, oh, I, I don't, I don't know what um, reason, you know, 9,000, why Sherilyn could never be a, an investigator. After Brian brutally Warren, he explains that he had put his hands in Ziploc bags and then put that in another bag and that he had put the head in um, the bag that his mother had found it in. He actually explained that first he had put the head in a pizza box that, that they had had like for pizza a couple nights prior and then put it in the bag afterwards. And it's through the just like the incredible work that the detectives did throughout this interview that they're able to to get all of this type of information I mean he's he did keep asking am I am I being cooperative enough like are you getting what you need from me but I think one of the biggest things that they wanted not just specifically like him admitting that he was the person who killed Warren but what had like led up to this point and Brian explains that he had always really had like a fascination with forensics and with anatomy and he said that he was prepared for what would happen to the body so that's why he had done the ziplocs and then transferred the head from the box into the bag because he said that there was like a three rule and he explains it as in three days there the body starts to omit like a foul odor in three hours, rigor mortis sets in. In three weeks, the body starts to seriously decompose. And in three months, the body is unrecognizable. And in three years, it turns into a skeleton. So everything was like this, his his rule of three. You took, was it the head and the hands? Mm -hmm. um, and when did you put that in? Well, there's a three rule for bodies. I like to call it the three rules. Okay, tell me about that. Three days, the body starts to stink. No, three hours, rigor mortis sets in, the body stiffens. Three days, the body starts to stink because of decomposition. Mm -hmm. 
three weeks. The body is starting to seriously decompose. Right, right. Three months, the body is unrecognizable. Three years, it turns into a skeleton. And may I ask how you know that? I just, I've always had a fascination with forensics and with anatomy and physiology. That's something I made up. So that's something I, I don't want to sound like I'm inventing something. But that's, what, that's why I coined the three rule. You kind of remember it that way. Yeah. That's your way of remembering it. Is it accurate? Well, somewhat, somewhat. He admits that prior to his mom finding the evidence in his room, he was already planning on disposing of the head and hands because he said that they were already, the head particularly was already starting to to smell. And so he was planning on buying a, like an empty paint bucket and then put the head in there, seal it, and then, and then dispose of it, like off of it in either a ditch or like off of a bridge. When Brian's asked why he chose who he did, that also infuriated me. He basically told police that when he saw Warren and knew that he didn't have a home and he was out there by himself, he was like essentially the perfect target because he's, he says to the police, no offense, but police don't seem to care as much for people who are homeless or sex workers. And so he he admits that he deliberately was looking for somebody that lived that type of life and found somebody who marked, you know, like checked the box for him of the requirements. And that just makes me so upset because we've talked about that in in many, many cases on this channel. And, you know, I think I always say based on your 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 life or your lifestyle, a situation that you've gotten yourself into, like it just does it just it doesn't define a person. It doesn't make excuses. And then for somebody like this I'm, I'm spitting everywhere. I'm so mad. Somebody like this who has this freaking warped, demonic mind to be like, oh yeah, like I see that too. So this this is a this is a perfect person to choose because nobody's gonna care because that is what they see like over and over and over again is that people in vulnerable situations they they don't get the same attention and they don't get the same like fight for them and ugh, like could just go on for hours. Brian also shares how the 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 situation with his vehicle um, the night before ties into all of this. So after he murdered and mutilated Warren, he drove home to go to bed, he said, and he notices that there was a hole in the gloves. And I don't know if you'll, you remember, I said he put on three sets of gloves deliberately so that he didn't leave any fingerprint or trace of him behind and so when he sees that there's this hole in the glove he was worried that there would be the possibility of a partial print being picked up and he he thought he'd have to go back so he changed his outfit went back into a different outfit and the the remain you know the, the rest of his body that was that he had just left he picks up puts it in his trunk and drove to the blue heron boat ramp to throw his body in the river he explains the the ramp and it's quite steep and he had backed it up as close as possible as he could to try to get the body into it because he does describe it as being quite heavy that he was actually surprised by the weight so he gets as close as humanly possible as he can to the water opens up the trunk and then puts warren's body in in the river so that you know hopefully the water just washes away any trace of like a fingerprint that he could have possibly left behind and he he says like he watched the body float away and tells the police my guess was that he was going to be discovered the next morning he was already anticipating that there was going to be something on the news about about find, finding Warren and then points out like because that didn't happen he's like yeah so like keep keep an eye out for any river related activity <sighs> after he sees that Warren is swept away in the river he attempts to get out 
of the spot and puts his car into drive, doesn't budge. He's trying like all different types of gear. It's not working. And as he's you know, trying to to get the vehicle moving, it actually starts to get swept in into the river and he sees that the car is filling up with water and then he starts panicking. It's the middle of February. He says it, it was a really cold night and then says that he's able to climb out which, you know, he's relieved about because he almost died. Not only did he mention that, he actually made the comment that he he was like, oh, good, I'm going to be remembered as like the guy of dying of hypothermia and butchering an attempt at hiding like this body that he had just killed. Like, I'm telling you, you guys, this is the I've never seen something like this. I'm panicking a bit at this point. I'm going to be like, this is what I'm going to be remembered for dying of hypothermia and a botched attempt at hiding a body. And I'm just like, fuck. Once again, we see Brian in good spirits while sharing what could pass as an amusing anecdote if it were not for the horrifying truth behind what he's describing. His story also shows that he has a preoccupation with how he'll be remembered. What's very I'm sure would be very unsettling for the person that this was is that it wasn't like Brian um called his parents right then and there I believe he left his phone back at the house so he actually had to go into the middle of the road and wait for somebody so that he could use their phone to call his parents and tell them what had happened can like can you imagine like there there was a person who stopped helped Brian let him use their phone and just explained the situation as like nothing too alarming. The driver just said that Brian was kind of pacing and just kept saying like, I effed up, I effed up, I effed up. And then the that the good Samaritan was like, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. Like these things happened and, you know, just trying to talk him down. So just didn't think really think any anything of it other than he was very, very concerned and worried. So he did notice that Brian was very, very panicked, but never expected it to be because he had just murdered somebody. He just thought he was like overly worried about what the consequences were going to be at home for him getting, you know, his car swept away in the river. I want to touch on what I had kind of mentioned before at the very start of this and just the signs because there were, in my opinion, I mean, I guess it's it would be so hard of how you want to move forward with somebody like Brian. There were a lot of signs. And this is beyond, you know, like his internet search history, which is was like ex- extremely incriminating in itself. He was wondering, you know, how to wipe data from from his phone. Um, does the a river wash away evidence? How to, you know, dispose of of a body? And his searches also contained a lot of searches and information on serial killers. And this is an obsession that he didn't just do on, you know, like in in the privacy of like his own searching. This was something that everybody knew about. Like I said, he was he was described as very morbid. And his parents explained that he had always kind of been fascinated with this type of stuff. So they even bought him like a crime scene investigation book and encouraged him to try to look into maybe getting a career or a job in forensics so that he could channel that curiosity into something more positive and just have like a good, I don't know, like a good impact on the world by helping solve cases and be the one that was okay with that type of, you know, that's it's a, it's a graphic job. So when police spoke to Brian's friends, Brian's teachers, they learned a lot more about that it wasn't just things that he kept to himself or talk, talk to his parents about. His friends, the specifically the one friend that he was actually with the following day and his parents called and told him to come back home, said that when she found out that he had killed somebody, she was not surprised at all. In fact, she thought that if he was going to do that, it would be on a larger scale. She thought the story that she would be told one day was that he was just going to snap and it would be like he shot up a store, like at a mall or something like that. Yet once in an interview, Kylan tells a different story. 
He never talked to me about wanting to kill a homeless person specifically, but he definitely talked to me a lot about, like, killing. And I was actually surprised because I figured that if he was going to do something like this, that it would be on a larger scale. Like, I thought he would, I don't want to sound vulgar, but I figured if he was going to snap, it would be like shooting up a store or something similar like that. And mm -hmm. he had mentioned, like, not liking his neighbors, so I thought maybe something would happen there. So I was actually really, I was surprised that he had killed someone, but I was also surprised that it had only been one person. She also said that he had talked quite a bit about not liking his neighbors. So possibly something would happen over there. And that just like made me think of, you know, of having that feeling and hear, hearing these comments. And then, you know, what, do you, what are you supposed to do with that information? At what point are you like, oh, it's just Brian being Brian? And when he had gone to her house earlier that day, even her and her mom had just figured like Brian, oh, here's Brian being Brian. Because when he showed up, he said, I think the police are, are going to try to frame me for a murder. And he says, I found a body and I was messing with it. And then I got my car stuck in the river and I had I had some blood that was on my hand and I, I wiped it on my car and I think the tow truck guy saw it and now and now they're going to try to frame me. So he was already kind of laying that foundation that day and the her his friend and her mom were just like didn't believe it but were also kind of like weren't surprised but it's just it's Brian being Brian. And all of the other friends that were in his friend group kind of said the same thing that Brian they were all kind of they described them, themselves as a group collectively as like a, a little bit weird but Brian more so than all of them and they they just wanted to try to accept him and that even if it was an, a joke that they would necessarily make it was just it was a joke it wasn't real I don't think this was something that he ever had shared with friends or family that I, I have any knowledge of but police did ask if he had ever killed somebody before and he said no he had never killed like a human before but says that um halloween of 2018 he had killed a stray black cat that was around his house and i mean i know like there are a lot of viewers are like myself and like acts of violence against animals are just like a no <laughs> no there is a place for hell waiting for people like like this so I'm not going to go into detail about what happened but all I'm going to say is that you know based on what he confessed to police about what he did to this cat like he clearly had a fascination with like keeping parts and again this was also something that was I guess like a rumor around ground junction of him killing cats one of the girls in his class had said that she lived near Brian and that there were cats always missing in the neighborhood so not even just this one that he's admitting to but allegedly that there were the cats that would went missing and people believed that he was stealing cats and doing something to them the question comes back in like where where does one go with this information because again I, I think about it after like covering these cases and it's another frustrating thing about having concerns when you go to authorities, they need evidence, right? And if you don't have it, it's always like, okay, well, come back when you do. And that's what's really frustrating about the, the system in general is so often nothing is done until it gets to that graphic point. And it almost did turn into a huge massacre. Brian had said that for about a year, he had been thinking about killing somebody and when he was originally thinking about it, it was thoughts of of shooting up his school. So it, it could have not just been one person. And I hate saying that. I hate like making an excuse being like, oh, it was one person. But this could have the, – the intentions were early on as like a, like a school massacre. That also – was something that there were signs pointing towards because in school teachers knew students knew he had a fascination with reading books on like uh, on Col on the Columbine shootings and said like he seemed to be obsessed with like darker things and had an unhealthy fascination with school shootings the interrogation is again redacted here but Brian says quote call me weird but I think everyone has had thoughts of shooting up their school I suppose I just don't really like people. 
Um, but he wanted to read really bizarre things and things that we didn't have in the library. Um, I remember he actually checked out a book about Son of Sam. And then the next quarter, he wanted to read about the Columbine shootings. He was very obsessed with just that kind of darker stuff. You mentioned a writing assignment. And I can't remember anything specific just because it's been so long. But it, it does seem like there was at some point something he wrote, an idea about Columbine or something like that. And I can't remember really the specifics. Okay. It's more of a sense that he had an unhealthy fascination with school shootings. And while I was listening to the story, I I was thinking of those things. Okay, as a parent, you always want to look for the best in your child and think the best and his his parents were trying to channel this curiosity into a positive thing. And so I thought, okay, I guess that would be the right thing to do because, you know, you're you're being supportive. You're acknowledging it. You're not making him feel like there's something terribly wrong. And there clearly was. But wanting something good, you know, to come out of this. But what got me was while Brian was talking to detectives, he says that this had not been the first time that his family had found something unsettling in his room. He said that the year prior, his parents had found a a, a kit that he was assembling. It had hammers, shovel, knives, zip ties, duck ties, um, duct ties, duct tape, and a saw. And he said like it was it was meant for hurting somebody. And when they found it, he had convinced them like, oh, it it was for other things. Like it's it's not what it looks like. And they didn't buy it, but there was an ultimatum that it needed to be thrown away. He was not to keep it. And if it wasn't thrown away or if they ever saw anything like that again, they would call the police and he would probably be arrested on charges of conspiracy. So again, it's like they're thinking that they're doing the the right thing, but I don't know. And once you find out more about the kit, like he said that that was, that was something that he was ready to just like go through with, but it didn't go to plan. And once again, he was going to look for somebody that he didn't think anybody would miss. And it was, a, he was going to look for a sex worker. He was going to force them to come with with him, subdue them, have them, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? I'm just, just very traumed out. Um, you know, what what is the word I'm looking for? Not withheld, but like restrained. Gosh, Cheryl, and that was painful, was going to restrain them and then admits that he would want to keep her to torture her, but couldn't because the, the kit was found before he was given the opportunity. And it wasn't just the parents thinking things to themselves and like, I, you know, I, trying to make excuses and do the right things and channel things or give him chances. When he was in school, there were multiple teachers who had reached out to them and said that they were concerned. There was a, a disturbing amount of interest in 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 dark things, serial killers, shootings, the way that he he acted. And the teachers had reached out to the parents saying like, this is serious and we need to get ahead of this because this is going to not go where, go somewhere well. And they're description of the way that the parents dealt with it was that they they didn't really want to listen to it or accept what they were being told the teachers at this point had pretty much just decided that they were going to keep in touch i guess several times his teachers case managers had all met together to talk about issues and then amongst each other figured out ways that they could try to support each other keep the other students safe like fully acknowledging that there was an issue here and all that they could really do at that point was just keep a really close eye on him and and try to like support him the best that they could without the the parents support of realizing that something was wrong with him. I don't know why they didn't have more support even just by authorities to move forward on I don't know getting him I don't I, I guess I don't know what the help would be but would would need to be like some form of intense intense therapy. There were not only were there signs but Brian had a- also acted on things. In 2018, he was arrested on assault charges when he had hit another student with homemade nunchucks that a friend of his had brought to school. 
And in 2019, he was suspended because he had intentionally caused a student who everybody knew had PTSD to suffer a panic attack by going up to her and clapping really loud near her because he knew that loud noises triggered her. So there were these instances where they have the supporting evidence that, okay, yes, you know, based on like school book drawings that are unsettling, the books that he's taking out of, you know, libraries or things that he's searching on the internet. Now there's actual things that he has done to different individuals to cause them harm. And it's like he would just basically kind of get a slap on the wrist and move forward. In fact, Terry, his mom, was upset with the school when he got in trouble for the nunchucks because in in her description of that whole situation, it was a friend of his who had brought these nunchucks. He had given Brian a set. He kept a set. And then it was Brian who got suspended, but not the other kid because there was no, you know, prior behavioral issues with him. But she felt like Brian was being treated unfairly. So definitely making excuses for him without even taking just the heinousness of the crime and what happened to Warren the whole the whole situation itself is so upsetting to me and it was so sad because it was so senseless detectives had even asked Brian like so at the end of all of this like did you get what you wanted did you enjoy it and he had basically said like it wasn't really what he had expected once he had you know cut off one of his limbs it was like oh okay yeah that's kind of like what I expected and and if he knew it it was all gonna turn out the way that it did like with him getting caught it was you know like it was nothing in his mind he said that he had read books about serial killers and how they explained it as just like the best the best feeling ever and he said that that it wasn't it at all so it just shows the fact that this was so senseless and happened because of just like his his twisted curiosity of murdering somebody. Ultimately, in January 2022, Brian pleaded not guilty by reasons of insanity, which I think is something that the investigators had in the back of their mind during that entire I- investigation and interrogation, which... I don't know how they did, but thank goodness they were able to do it the way that they did and get the information out the way that they did because it showed so much premeditation. And then after the fact, like the the wherewithal of knowing that like he needed to cover his tracks because what he did was wrong and and that he was not insane. I think have, having the, the insanity plea probably did even worse for him just to show how cold he is even now moving forward like a year after the process because what happened was they're having the plea triggered a, a, psych, a psychological evaluation and when he's asked about certain things he's just as like cold and matter of fact in those evaluations too when he's asked like how he how he feels about everything he says yeah it just kind of sucks what happened and when he's asked what sucks like about like what you did you know about Warren not having the chance to live anymore he says that it sucks that he's locked up and that he can't see his friends and that he really misses video games and being able to go on the internet so all of the remorse is for himself and none for the victim whatsoever and ultimately a jury rejected the uh, insanity defense and he was found guilty on all counts of evidence tampering two counts of tampering with a deceased human body one count of in the first degree and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole which is a lot more than the 15 years that he opened up his interview with or interrogation with police with when he was like so I'm probably going to get like 15 to 20 years. I think there is so much to be taken from this case. I think uh, it's a huge lesson on believing people when they tell you exactly who they are for one like if if they're if they're constantly 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 like making these jokes it's it's like a joke is not a joke sometimes when it's kind of like your personality and you take that on as like your brand and your persona like believe that when people do that and uh, an even more important lesson in all of this I think is to treat vulnerable people 
like humans because it's exactly what they are. They are not less than anybody else because of their circumstances whatsoever. Those who knew Warren described him as just an amazing person and you never know what somebody is going through, what situation brought them to where they are then. We've covered so many cases where when you actually learn about some of the situations that have people living that way, it's devastating and through no fault of their own. So we need to switch that message up. And specifically, we need to have law enforcement also support that change of the narrative because, I mean, this kid is specifically saying that he targeted Warren with the intention of getting away with it because it was his perception that the police did not care with it, you know, with with them, with he, they wouldn't care about Warren whatsoever and that he was he he was going to be OK. So that in itself, I mean, thank God that's not the situation that that's not what ended up happening. But I feel like if there hadn't been those the incident the night before and his parents finally coming forward and doing the right thing, it would have been a lot easier to try to dismiss Warren, Warren disappearing as OK, well, you know, that he 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 just probably doesn't want to be found. So I don't know. It was it would I found I found it very telling, almost like su- Brian supporting what we've been saying for so long. Like this is how they think about it. And then look what the frick happens when somebody with that, you know, that type of mentality decides to just fucking act on it. Okay. I needed to desperately just think of something positive to try to warm my heart after all of this. And I thought about the people who did show kindness to Warren and were the ones who did the right thing and called authorities and talked amongst each other and just treated him with like a lot of love and and support and opened their doors to him and were the ones who acted so fast to make sure that he got justice because you know he he did not deserve to lose his life so senseless and so coldly and he certainly would never have deserved to be somebody who just got forgotten you know so we need a lot more people like warren's friends in this world and that is where i'm going to leave off today a man is trapped in a room that contains only two exits the first is constructed of magnifying glasses that fry anything that walks through when the sun is out and blazing hot. The second exit includes a fire-breathing dragon that is bound and determined to kill. How does the man escape? Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so much. I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.